We're so excited to announce our new partnership with Therapy Notes. Whether you're looking to streamline your private practice or you're a solo clinician juggling it all, Therapy Notes has you covered. Rated 4.9 stars on Trustpilot. It's no wonder they're the most trusted EHR for behavioral health. Try Therapy Notes for two months free using the promo code MODERN today. Looking for ways to get more private pay clients? Thryzer is a payment app that makes out-of-network therapy more accessible. Thryzer verifies your clients' out-of-network benefits, so when they pay, they are only charged what they actually owe, while you continue to earn your full rate. Check out our special link, join.thryzer.com forward slash modern therapist, and use the code modern therapists to activate $2,500 in free payments with Thryzer. You're listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide, where therapists live, breathe, and practice as human beings. To support you as a whole person and a therapist, here are your hosts, Kurt Widhelm and Katie Vernoy. Welcome back, Modern Therapists. This is the Modern Therapist Survival Guide, and this is the podcast for therapists where we discuss the things going on in our field, the ways that we have historically been as a field. And before we get to the content of this episode, we recommend that you go over to pitchforkemporium.com and select amongst the finest pitchforks that you can get because I have a feeling this one might bring up some feelings. And as always, we encourage people to Share your thoughts about our episodes on our social media or over in our Facebook group, the Modern Therapist Group. But we are starting this episode looking at an article from Mad in America about whether or not there is clinical utility in the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. And this article says no. Katie and I are podcast hosts, and we apparently have enough time on our hands to dive into this inadequately and but extensively this but is, extensively this is at least recording number two <laughs> we are are putting an opportunity for a lot of community feedback on this as well but katie you were the one who originally came across this article you sent this over to me you said let's make a podcast so <laughs> i'm gonna start this over with you all right so the the premise behind this article is based in another article by let me find it's, it. it's it's articles all the way down people it's, it's just... articles just so many articles all the way down okay uh this is from a this is a Mad in America article that basically is just summarizing an article from the Journal of Royal Society of Medicine by Mulder and Tyrer. Uh, this is in 2023, and it talks about their big concerns about using the diagnosis borderline personality disorder, uh, calling it a heterogeneous catch-all that is not actually a personality disorder because it talks about symptoms versus traits. One of the authors, Tyra, in 2009 had talked about maybe this is more of a recurrent unstable mood disorder, and we should maybe call it flexithymia. Uh, there's been huge debates, including by Kurt and me, for hours trying to get to a place where we can actually have an episode here about whether or not uh, BPD is just complex uh, PTSD, which we're still uh, probably going to have to sort through on this episode, but but really the the reason that I wanted to bring this up is in the Madden America article as well as the source material. They they talk about how the differential diagnosis is is pretty broad. Uh, looking through ADHD, bipolar, mood disorders, trauma, autism, psychosis, chronic sleep disturbance was one of the ones that was saying that some of this stuff can happen because of those things. And so they were saying it's it's not diagnosed well. There's huge bias, which leads to a lot of clinician issues where they dismiss these these uh, patients that come with with similar presentations, and that there there really isn't specific treatments for BPD that aren't, you know, just kind of other things pulled together. And we're not going to go into that <laughs> element of it, but they they went pretty far to basically say there's no clinical utility to this diagnosis at all. And I'm still figuring out where I sit with that. Where where do you sit with that, Kurt? 
I'm going to start with just kind of maybe a little bit of history in this. Oh. You and I were talking about this in many of our discussions leading into this episode. So the origination of borderline personality started out, as you and I have discussed, as being the borderline between neurosis and psychosis. Yes. And we are both very well aware of the historical ways, both within the mental health treatment community, as well as the greater society at large that has weaponized calling particularly women uh, or, or female presenting people as being borderline when they're having emotional reactions to things or yes. generally being perceived to be difficult. Yes. I was trained in, when I was in grad school, we were still under the DSM-4TR, and one of the things that my professors at the time had really talked about is in the classification out of, at the time, the Axis two personality disorders and mental retardation, out of the things on Axis two, the one that was treatable was borderline personality disorder. And so I've maybe not had always kind of the same bias that was taught to me that many other people have. I'm very well aware that it has been a huge bias. I see it very consistently and currently as far as, you know, some of the Facebook group posts that we see or some of the ways that I hear other clinicians talking about things as far as like, I think I have a borderline on my hands that I generally try to create some some more positive space and understanding around. So I'm not saying that I'm going to be the perfect representation on this at all, but I am going to say that there are definitely a lot of very bad people presenting, not bad people, there are people who are presenting very bad ideas about BPD historically. I think that a lot of people who are perceived as being BPD have been misdiagnosed when really things have started out as relational trauma. This is a way of expressing some of the big feelings that have been out there. Some people who probably have a true complex PTSD diagnosis have probably been misdiagnosed as borderline personality disorder. Ultimately, I'm going to make the case, well, I'm going to attempt to, that... <laughs> I agree that BPD probably does not need to be a diagnosis. I'm not ready to jump in that it's just CPTSD. Okay. I think the the biggest piece is before we jump into, is it something different or is it a particular presentation of complex PTSD. I, I just want to comment on some of the the stuff I was reading about the harm related to misdiagnosis were from some autistic folks who were not of a gender typically diagnosed with autism. And I think to me, you know, especially when we look at rejection sensitivity dysphoria, we look at autistic meltdowns, we look at a lot of things. I think we need to really talk through maybe, maybe briefly the differential diagnosis here, because to me, it seems like when, when, Usually a female client comes in and they are pushing back or they're asking hard questions or they're doing things that maybe historically would have been dismissed as BPD. I think we are doing a huge disservice if we don't dig deeper into causes, into where, the, you know, kind of the, the makeup of, of these symptoms. And for me, that's why I get really hesitant about keeping a diagnosis that has this catch-all because it, it feels too easy to go to BPD when you have an annoying client or when you have a client that's challenging you. And I know for myself, and, and I may have talked about this in another episode, I don't remember, but I had a, a client who actually had psychosis, who was asking some questions that felt like BPD to me and was like, I don't know, should I kill myself? Stuff like that. And it felt like it was pulling from a different place. But once I was able to get additional information and recharacterize this client as psychotic versus BPD, it completely changed how I was interacting with the symptoms. And so for me, the, the bias that clinicians have and the difficulty they have moving past their own discomfort with some hard symptoms, I think 
really gets us off on the wrong foot. You get the sense that the rush to create a billable diagnosis often makes us overlook some of these things that ultimately gets us to a point where we just kind of end up diagnosing things out of our own reactions rather than taking a lot more pragmatic look at causes in history when it leads to presentations like this. I think that's I, I think that's fair to say, especially I'm I'm thinking about where really intense symptomatology might show up in inpatient units in places where usually under-resourced staff, staff that are, you know, kind of familiar with gallows humor and it's us against them and those kinds of things. And I know that's that's not every single inpatient place. And that's, I, I don't, I don't want to overstate that, but I, I think there's that element of when we don't have resources and we have to get to a diagnosis very quickly, I think it is perfectly reasonable that we're going to miss stuff. I think it's when we stop looking that we really, we, we really harm our clients. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, in some of the things that you're talking about, as far as, you know, uh, particularly assigned female at birth, neurodivergent clients presenting with some of the features that fall under a BPD as currently defined. I'm, you're going to get sure. annoyed hearing me say that during this episode, <laughs> but as currently defined, some of the overlapping features of the two. One of the things that we have spent a long time discussing before the episode is kind of getting to this point that looking at some of the causes for why some of the perceived deficits or the skills that may be missing, whether it's BPD, whether it's complex PTSD, whether it's ASD, whether it's any of ABCD, the other any, any other alphabet, <laughs> al alphabet sort of things here, yeah, is kind of the the cause of it you know there are specific you know relational skills that might be missing in that bpd presentation that may be due to trauma and that may have more in common with a complex ptsd thing than somebody who is neurodivergent who has other reasons why those skills may be missing developmentally down the road and i think that this is a necessary important distinction to make and Due to the nature of this episode, we're acknowledging it, but we're not going to dive deeply within like, okay, we, we see it. Maybe we'll have a Patreon episode or something else where we go deeper <laughs> on this. But, uh, I, but I do want to address it for just a second, because I think so there is some messiness here that I just want to to illustrate why I have such a hard time getting to a clear call to action or a clear response to, is this uh, helpful? When someone has a lot of trauma throughout development, I want to just kind of go into this real quickly so that that I can express some of the things that gets me kind of, that, that messes with my brain. <laughs> okay. As someone is growing up and there's a lot of trauma that's happening to them, and some might call that complex PTSD, that might be, you know, I'm, I'm not worried about that diagnosis for this this point. When you have trauma at important developmental milestones, you miss things, you learn how to be in relationships based on relational trauma, there's a lot that happens there. And so for me, when someone has a really complex picture of trauma in their childhood, it's going to impact who they are when they grow up. And it could be, you know, post-traumatic growth and air quotes. It could be PTSD. It could be complex trauma. It could be a lot of things, right? Right. I think the the other challenge is when you are growing up as a neurodivergent person, when you grow up as a neurodivergent person, your brain works differently and you interact with the world differently. And there's also typically other types of relational trauma, other types of things that happen as well. And so there is trauma and may impact how you develop as well. So you have both the neurodivergent picture and you have both the, the trauma picture. If you have psychosis, if you have bipolar, if you have like if, 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 if we keep going right, on right, to all right. these other differential diagnoses and there is trauma, all of these things layer in to make a very difficult diagnostic picture because we can't, is it neurodivergent? Is it trauma? Is it a personality disorder? Is it, what is this? I think this is why differential diagnosis is so challenging 
And oftentimes I go to, who are you? (laughs) What symptoms are you displaying that are problematic to you? And let's start there versus I'm going to label you with a particular diagnosis because that's the easiest thing to do. And, And I don't know how many people end up with the throwaway BPD diagnosis or the catch all, you know, BPD diagnosis, but that's, that's why I worry about it because I feel like it's so complicated to try to sort through, tease out what is what. And that's where one of the many conclusions and sweeping statements that we're going to make is that a lot of clinicians are lazy and just kind of (laughs) throw out a bad diagnosis on something that ends up being harmful to to other people. Okay. I don't know if I'd say a lot, but I'm worried about the ones Uh, who do. (laughs) I I would say it's a significant amount enough that many of us are like, yeah, we see that. All right. I'm not not saying it's all. I'm not saying it's half. I'm not saying that it's a quarter. I'm not, you know, you're not not going to define it. You're just saying Uh, this is a problem. So stop doing it. <laughs> uh, there, there's there's more than seven out there that like. <laughs> sure, sure. It's a, a less than a non-significant or it's a more than non-significant amount. Yes. All right, moving on. Therapy Notes is the highest rated EHR for behavioral health, combining secure billing, scheduling, telehealth, documentation, and even e-prescribe in one easy to use software. And they're always adding new features to help therapists provide better care to their patients. In addition to tutorial videos, live webinars, and articles designed to help you along the way, they also offer free live customer support seven days a week with new extended hours to better accommodate West Coast customers. Use promo code MODERN for two months free and see what all the hype is about. Let's bring this back to, all right, let's look at what is called BPD as it currently stands. And maybe this is where I'm going to make the overture that I think that there's a a core enough group of symptoms that warrants maybe a, a, a refreshed diagnosis, a new name, one without the history that goes along with it, but one that is actually different from CPTSD. So what are the symptoms that you see are as distinctive? Because I think this is where I get, um, this is where I've, I've stumbled the most in trying to figure out what the real differences are. It just feels like they're, you can explain a lot of these differences from trauma. <laughs> sure. So within this combination of, I don't know, a spectrum of looking things, let's first start with CPTSD and PTSD. Okay. Uh, Because I I think that this is where it's not just like a a natural spectrum where it's just like, oh, the more features that you show shows which severity of these diagnoses that there are. I think that there's enough literature that defines what PTSD is. That's pretty straightforward. I think that in the emergence of complex PTSD and what makes it PTSD is kind of the re-experiencing of trauma. And the sense of fear of threat to self and the oftentimes high levels of anxiety that go along with it. Now, this is a nuanced discussion where there is a lot still, uh, there's still a lot of overlap that can happen between complex PTSD and BPD. We're not there yet. Okay. But but, but just to, to clarify what you're saying complex PTSD by nature has the symptomatology of PTSD. Yes. And if it doesn't, it's something else. Yeah. Okay. And and I think that that's really where getting into a little bit of the, the nuanced picture helps us to say, you know, it's PTSD with very complex, you know, origins, very complex presentations of things. That can also be in addition to what is currently called borderline personality disorder. I would love to come up with some sort of metaphor or some sort of new name for like what it should be called instead of what I'm ultimately trying to land on here. But starting to differentiate between complex PTSD and BPD is complex PTSD when it comes to relationships tends to show 
more avoidance of entering into relationships. There's a sense of self that exists, but getting into relationships with other people can feel very threatening. And that can lead to avoidance aspects and isolative aspects that is not shared with some of the features of I don't know, BPD 2.0, or uh, it doesn't even feel right in saying that, but like unyet named new kind of still differently needed to be recognized for different treatment purposes, diagnostic label here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if anyone followed that, Kurt's still not renaming BPD, but, but we're, I, I, we're getting I'm, to I'm, the point of saying like, yes, we think it needs to be renamed. We just don't it, have it, it, re it needs to be renamed. And the, the reason for it is, the features that I think are very, very different is that what is currently called BPD has a feature of an absence of self that complex PTSD does not. I think what is currently called BPD has a different approach to relationships. I don't see the things in the literature, the clients that I see in my practice who are truly BPD as currently defined, avoiding entering into relationships. I, I see that there is a desire to be in relationships, a desire to become, you know, all invested into relationships. Some of that great idealization and then great, you know, kind of diminishment of the people that they enter into relationships with that is significantly different than kind of the avoidance that I see and the literature tends to show when it comes to complex PTSD avoidance of those relationships. I see, I see the distinction between the two relationship styles. And honestly, it kind of doesn't matter to me. Like I get that this is a difference. So let me explain why it doesn't I, I, matter to me. Can, can, before, before you explain, can I tell you how I'm going to hear whatever you're explaining first? Sure. I'm looking, I'm listening through this as far as different attachment styles. Yeah. And if the, you would make the same arguments as far as different attachment styles, but I'm curious what you're going to say. Here. <laughs> well, for me, the, the distinction on attachment styles or relationship, the way someone interacts in their relationships is to me a, a, a distinction on a response, right? I think for me, I need to get past it being based in, in complex trauma because for me, I can see having a CPTSD with avoidant relationships and a CPTSD with reactive relationships or whatever. I don't know the right name. I mean, I can see it as being two different presentations with a similar background. And so for me saying like, well, well, there's these things, but one person is is running towards relationships and one's running away. Like I'm like, Okay, but we have, you know, de agitated depression and can't get out of bed depression. We have lots of different presentations that still fall under the same thing because in truth, even on treatment, helping someone to get to a place where they can trust people and have strong relationships with people is something you want for both of those presentations. So I don't know that even the distinction in the relational style pushes me to like, oh, yes, these are absolutely different things. And so for me, I would need to see how does BPD show up or what is currently called BPD show up without trauma? Like for me, that's the trauma makeup and, and the thing that comes through. Like there's, there's slightly different profiles. I get that. But they don't seem like they're so extremely different in, in how when you're actually talking about them with a client. You know, and, well, and they're not mutually exclusive. I can avoid relationships and and then the relationships I have, I can have this high approach and then also diminishment of the people around me. So I feel like they're not necessarily mutually exclusive and I don't feel like they're so different. It's trouble with relationships because of what's happened in the past. Just popping in quickly to let you know that Thrizer is a payment app that gets you more private pay clients. Thryzer links with your client's health insurance and verifies how much their insurance covers for out-of-network therapy. 
When clients pay for sessions with Thryzer, they are only charged what they actually owe. Thryzer covers the rest of your fee and works with their insurance to get the reimbursement. That means that your clients can use Thryzer to save upfront with their out-of-network benefits when paying for your sessions instead of submitting super bills and waiting for reimbursement. Thryzer is a great way to collect payments from your clients. Like all payment processors, their credit card fee is 3%, which is the only fee you pay for using the platform. Thryzer is a mission-driven company that believes therapy should be accessible to everyone and therapists should earn a good living. Their platform helps do just that. Clients only ever pay what they owe while you continue to earn your full rate. Check out our special link, join.thryzer.com forward slash modern therapist and use the code modern therapists to activate $2,500 in free payments with Thryzer. The literature that I've been looking at, and we'll include our our reference list in our show notes over at mtsgpodcast.com. I mean, the, the huge rabbit holes that we went down, there's going to be a lot in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the literature that I was looking at kind of consistently shows that the cluster of symptoms that I'm describing for as yet unnamed diagnostic category that yeah. I'm hearing you describe as kind of like these are, you know, a checklist of add-on features that could be done with CPTSD. Mm -hmm. it, it, am I correctly reflecting what it's, you're it's saying? It's a, a different presentation. Like it's giving, saying like, this is the underlying and there's this presentation, this presentation, and maybe a third presentation. Like it's, somebody has been extremely traumatized and they're going to show up in one of a few ways. And, and this is how we, how we work with them is based on understanding that there's huge amounts of underlying trauma that lead into these presentations. So the literature that I've been looking at says that in validating BPD, I'm not fully agreeing with this, but sure. BPD can exist without a trauma history. Okay. So where does it come from? <laughs> this is why... I like to look at it versus as the state versus trait idea. You know, okay. I'm I'm kind of sidestepping your direct question here and saying it doesn't necessarily matter where it comes from if there's no trauma history because it's still treating the traits that show up. It's sure. teaching skills, it's being able to have a better sense of self-identity yeah. sorts of things it's better relational skills sorts of things sure that in a good differential diagnosis all right you, you don't have a trauma history so we don't have to do the trauma experiences aspect of working through this literature kind of consistently shows that not all people who have correctly diagnosed bpd have trauma histories a lot of them do and those are needing to treat two different diagnoses can I can I respond to that really quick before you move on? Because I I would be very curious, especially in my history and the history and, and the folks I've supervised and all that stuff. There are folks who come to us that have never told anyone else about their trauma history. They've never disclosed any of it. I've had people who've done intakes and none of that was disclosed, came back to the second session, told me their trauma history. So I I I feel like saying, like, well, they don't have trauma histories, like. How how sure of that are we, I guess, is the real question. There's a handful of meta-analyses that we will keep in our references here that have at least several hundred participants in latent class analyses research that go through trauma histories of people and consistently find a difference between CPTSD as currently defined and BPD as currently defined. So have fun reading those references we have just a few minutes getting to this point here so once again are available over at mtsgpodcast.com the big feature differences though is i think i'm hearing you describe it as there's trauma and there's different presentations of it mm -hmm. i'm looking at it as in the absence of trauma this is a standalone diagnosis not warranted necessarily as a personality disorder. These are things where treatments and skills allow for people to move through these symptomologies that there is a, it's not a life sentence to you are forever going to be seen this way. 
There's a lot of history that goes along with needing to throw out BPD that is, you know, badly handled in our field. Yeah, there's a lot of people with this that do have this as a trauma response and a relational trauma response. I acknowledge all of the points that you're saying here. I think that it doesn't necessarily mean that somebody has a trauma history, and that's why it needs its own separate diagnosis in order to be able to treat this cluster of symptoms that doesn't have the reenactment or the the re-experiencing of feelings that the it's not a threat to sense of self because there's not a sense of self in the same way. That's why I see it as like, okay, th- there's a place that it needs to land. Um, but we kind of need to look at it as this is not just extra features on top of an already existing diagnosis. I think that's as far as we can get with the time we have. And I, I think we're pretty close together. I think it's just, I still feel very strongly that there is such a huge uh, relationship to to trauma history or to underdiagnosed other things. And so I think for me, I, I'm going to just come back to differential diagnosis, see the human in front of you, just because someone is challenging, don't go to, I can't work with this person. They must be BPD. Are, are we signing up for a part two of this episode? <laughs> Maybe. I bet we're going to get some responses. So probably we'll we'll have a, a part two, whether we like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, we'd love to hear your input on this. You can let us know through our social media or uh, send us a message and you can join our Facebook group, the Modern Therapist Group. If you want to support us, become a Patreon member. And the- and then if you do that, you can actually come and talk with us in a mm-hmm. like a coffee hour or Q&A and, 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 and have dep- this conversation with you. <laughs> and depending on the level of Patreon that you want to join at, we might create a level where you can see our poorly recorded earlier versions of this. Episode. <laughs> I don't know if I feel comfortable with that. <laughs> and until next time, I'm Kurt Woodhouse with Katie Bernoy. Don't forget to check out Therapy Notes, the best practice management solution for behavioral health. And use promo code MODERN for two months free. Care more and worry less with Therapy Notes. Remember to check out Thryzer for a new way to attract and retain cash pay clients. It's a win-win concept that makes out-of-network therapy more accessible while you earn your full rate. Visit join.thryzer.com forward slash modern therapist for more information and to get set up in minutes. And use the code modern therapists for $2,500 in free payments on Thryzer. Thank you for listening to the Modern Therapist Survival Guide. Learn more about who we are and what we do at mtsgpodcast.com. You can also join us on Facebook and Twitter. And please don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of our episodes.